Hi, I'm Bill Hodges, and this is Spotlight on Government. Today, we have Kevin Beckner, State Countywide District 6 County Commissioner here in Hillsborough County. Thanks for having me, Bill. I, I am excited to have you. Every time you come, I learn so much. You seem to be a person that stays on top of everything. I don't know how you can do that with everything that's going on in the county. Well, it is a challenge sometimes because the county is facing many, many challenging issues. Of course, first and foremost has been on um, the economy. Uh, but then it's really prioritizing, you know, covering the, uh, the entire county, really looking at what all the other district needs are, what really needs to be done uh, countywide. Uh, it can add up to be a lot. You know, sometimes I think we ask just a little bit too much of the people who are represented. With all the things going on in the county, it, I would hate to be in your chair and have you say to me, as you did earlier, everything's fair game, ask me anything you want. Well, absolutely. And, uh, you know, again, that's, that's one of the things, though, I enjoy about being countywide um, is dealing with all the diverse issues that are out there. And, uh, you know, since I've been in office in 2008, there have been, uh, there's, it's been challenging. And a lot of people, uh, in fact, have mentioned the same thing that you have is that they're glad that it's, that it's me. Um, and not them that's in this particular seat. But uh, with my background, uh, you know, we've been very focused on, again, uh, what we can do to um, um, pick up the economy, that we can uh, c continue the job creation, working with the private sector. And also we've taken uh, the, these challenging times and we've done a lot to actually look at uh, on how we can reorganize, reprioritize, and make government a little bit more efficient. Kevin, you mentioned your background. I know a lot of people already know who you are. You've been around for a while now. But what is your background? Where did you come from? What is your education? What did you do before you became a county commissioner? I've actually been a small business owner pretty much my whole entire life. And, uh, and growing up, there's two things that I wanted to my do. My condolences. <laughs> <laughs> so have I. <laughs> Uh, there's two things that, uh, that I looked at doing in life. One was getting into law enforcement and the other was to continue um, in the private sector. And so uh, when I uh, graduated from Indiana University, I grew up in Michigan City, Indiana, went to um, IU. When I graduated there, I uh, went actually back to Chicago and um, lived in Chicago for a period of years and then moved down here just a little over 13 years ago. Interestingly, I, I looked at law enforcement myself. When I got out of the Strategic Air Command, all my buddies were people that were in military police. They all went to the police department and tried to get me to go there, and I said, eh, I don't think so. Yeah, I served three years as a police officer. Oh, you did? And, and then uh, when I graduated from IU, decided that I was going to take the business course. And then so um, I got into the musical entertainment business, which I actually had been involved with uh, at that particular point in time for about 11 years. Musical and entertainment. Musical entertainment, going out and hiring uh, entertainers and, oh, okay. and actually entertaining myself. So um, uh, I did a lot of weddings, became known as a wedding singer. And so uh, that was <laughs> I enjoyable. didn't know you were a singer. I enjoy singing quite well, a bit. Well, to bring music next time. <laughs> uh, but then I get moved down here um, the end of 19, or at the June of 1998, and um, became a certified financial planner. And uh, from there, um, I started getting involved in politics probably about 2006 or so. Do you still do financial planning or do you have all of your effort has to go now to the county? Well, most of it is involved with the county work that I do, but I've got a, a business partner and a great staff. So I still have um, our financial planning practice that I'm involved really? with. Yes. What is the name of it? It's a, it's a franchise through Ameriprise Financial. And so uh, we practice here in Tampa and uh, have our offices in uh, South Tampa. And like I said, th that's been a great business. I've enjoyed doing that. And uh, it's actually helped me quite a bit having to deal with the budgets uh, on the county level. What made you decide to go into politics? The hours are terrible. The respect you get is less than good. What made you decide to go into do something like this? Well, as when I moved down here and I started taking a look at um, some of the things that uh, this community didn't have versus somewhere like Chicago, like say for instance, I noticed we didn't have a complete transportation network here, and you started looking at the infrastructure that was lacking, and then really when I started paying attention and every time you heard on the news that the county commission was working on some type of other divisive issue, um, things that I didn't think were moving the county forward, um, like many other people, I, uh, I joined in the course and started complaining on the sidelines. <laughs> And then uh, after, after a period of time, 
I'm having conversations with the elected officials, both past and present. They said, well, you know what, Kevin, if you really want to make a difference, um, you should stop complaining and step up to the plate and consider running for public office. Now, you didn't make it the first time you ran, did you? Oh, yes, yeah. Did you make it the first time? 2008 was the first time that I ran. Um, we actually, I, uh, I launched I the remember that election, but I was thinking there was something before that. No, sir. Um, we started the campaign in 2007, put together a grassroots uh, um, uh, campaign that consisted of about 400 volunteers and, and wore out a lot, of, uh, a lot of tennis shoes, doing a lot of walking, connecting with people, and just really focusing on different ways and listening to people on uh, the issues that they thought were important to our community and what we uh, needed to do to move our community forward. I'd like to look at what's happening today, but since you mentioned that, then your four years, your first four years are, are rapidly coming to a close, is that correct? That's correct. 2012 this year is, is my re-election year already. What do you think are the most substantial things that have happened in that four years? Well, first, I think looking at the economy, um, since I've been elected in 2008 and uh, with the diminishing tax rolls and the tax values here in our county. That had to have been a hit. It's uh, incredible. We started at, with a budget at uh, $4 billion, and now we're down to about uh, $3 billion. So in that short period of time, our operating expenditures and, uh, and sources have uh, dwindled to uh, almost a $1 billion. Um, so we really had to start reprioritizing and look at um, what, does, uh, what should government be doing and what should we be doing as, as government. Um, so although it's been extraordinarily challenging economically, I think when we go forward we'll look at the changes that we've, we've made in government. For instance, the consolidations that we have uh, made, um, our business services uh, department, uh, we, continue, we continue to look for, our, we're looking for ways to uh, cut the red tape in government. And that's where I think when we come out of um, the economic situation that we're in, we're going to be better off from the restructuring. Um, so economically, it's been challenging, but also it's forced us to think outside the box. Um, we're starting to uh, uh, work a lot more with the city. Um, we're just, we've just launched an effort where we're going to be um, combining our accounting systems, known as the ERP process. I saw that. That looked like a good idea. It was, and in fact it is. It's uh, nearly five years in the making. And so uh, um, when I came into, into government, there was, there was a lot of the, uh, the headbutting. It seemed like the, it was the county versus the city. And so um, through these difficult times, we've learned that we've had to work together. It can no longer be us against them. It's, it's, it's trying to find different ways that we can, um, uh, again, create efficiencies and, and run better government. And so we find that uh, we can do that better together than separate. I I find it funny because people will look at me and say, why do you promote Tampa? You don't live in Tampa. You live outside of Tampa. But if the core dies, everything goes. And this arguing back and forth between city and county just doesn't make any sense to me. I've never heard anybody say, I'm going to fly into Brandon next week. <laughs> no, Tampa is looked at as the economic hub. Of course, all of our municipalities are important uh, to our community. Sure they are. Um, but Tampa is, uh, you know, is one of the larger economic engines with, with things such as the port and other important pieces into our community. Um, that's where a lot of the economic efforts are driven. And so they're extraordinarily important. And so, again, trying to pit the county against the city, um, it just it doesn't make any sense. Um, both from a community standpoint as well as uh, from an economics. And so we have just found, again, when we can team up together, uh, there's a lot of great progress that, that we can make. This port being the fifth largest in the United States, uh, Mr. Wainio was on the show not long ago talking about that. I mean, where do all those trucks come from that go to the port? They come from the county. Right. And actually, with the I-4 connector that we're going to have coming in there, it's going to make also transportation a lot easier uh, going in, into uh, uh, not only the port, but also access into Tampa. Um, so again, uh, you know, between the port, uh, the county has its agriculture, and, uh, you know, we are just really looking uh, to take advantage of the economic downtimes to create new industries. Uh, working with the private sector, we're focusing on bringing financial, the finan more financial companies here. Um, we're looking at the biomed possibilities. Uh, we have great partnership with USF. Um, so there are many great opportunities and partnerships that we have in the county, and uh, that's what we'll continue to build upon. We have a real brain trust here with USF, and we've got the medical with the the Moffitt and the, the vet, VA hospital and all the others. This should be a real solid area for biomedical. 
Oh, absolutely. And that's my larger concern is to make sure that we can uh, form a better collaboration with one another. Because you talk about the brain trust, uh, the larger concern is the brain drain, uh, making sure that we can provide great jobs for, for people that are graduating from the surrounding universities and also to track younger people into our community. Um, so, but uh, that, can't pay them in sunshine. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. You know, everybody has to have a good paying job and be able to make a living. And so we certainly want to make that happen here. Looking back over the four years before we slip into today, are there any other things that come to mind readily to you? Um, there's a not, one of the things, Bill, that I really enjoyed, again, about working countywide there's, is the diverse issues. Um, when I first got elected into office, I worked with the Sun City uh, residents that one of their larger challenges were, was transportation. Even though it's a more global around the county, they had a unique transportation situation where they couldn't take their golf carts across uh, 301 to get to Walmart. I uh, used that the other day. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, so uh, we uh, put together a coalition and the residents uh, rallied together and we went to Tallahassee to lobby for the efforts and eventually uh, we were able to work out a deal here locally um, with the developer to get an easement and um, that connection that was supposed to cost eight million dollars, um, we got that down to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars and uh, you know we were able to solve an issue. Um, on a larger scale there's also the issue of uh, prescription drug overdoses. Um, we, uh, uh, Hillsborough County was number one in the state for a period of time of prescription drug overdoses, losing uh, one citizen a day. Um, so I worked with the sheriff's one office. One a day? One a day. Wow. One a day. To prescription drug overdoses. We're not talking about illegal drugs. Well, they kind of sort of were <laughs> illegal drugs. Well, they're prescribed by uh, so-called medical doctors. Right. But unfortunately, uh, because of the profits that were made, that could be made from prescription drugs like oxycodone, um, you know, it became a problem. And they're right underneath our noses. There were illicit clinics that were over, doctors are over prescribing drugs to those clinics. So I worked with the sheriff's office to put together an ordinance to shut down those illicit clinics. And uh, up to date, we have a little over 20 of those clinics closed. Still have a long ways to go to fight prescription drug abuse uh, here in our community, but that's a step. Um, working with our at-risk youth has been important to uh, help those kids that uh, don't have the same opportunities as you and I to uh, be able to get a job, to go into the military, or also uh, to finish school, of course, is important. Um, and probably the larger issue you've been hearing a lot about is uh, regard to PIP insurance fraud, and especially related to Let's estate auto accidents. Let's explain that a little bit, because PIP is picture in picture for me. No, I, I know what it is, but maybe a lot of people don't. So. Give me a little primer on PIP. Sure. Everybody that has automobile insurance is required in the state of Florida to carry PIP or personal injury protection. Um, that gives you about $10,000 of protection, and it goes into the no-fault system. So if you're in an accident and you sustain medical in injuries, um, no matter who's at fault, you have $10,000 that will, that will pay for initial medical payments. What we have found is that there are many unscrupulous people that are taking advantage of the system. And although there's different stages of fraud, there's also organized crime that is, per, that is running, organized crime uh, rings that are running PIP fraud. And what they would do is they, will, they would collaborate with one another. Two individuals would stage to get in an auto accident. They would go to a designated clinic who is also involved with the scam. And they also, uh, there are doctors that the are The driver and person getting hit, or, or the two cars that are owned by the, the two scammers? Everybody's involved in this whole entire scam, and including doctors, including attorneys that would represent them. And what they would do is they'd stage the auto accident, and then they would um, bill the PIP insurance. And there may only have been two people involved in that car, but by the time the report and everything's finished, there may be seven, eight, nine, or ten. So take that, <laughs> take those numbers. Bunches of passengers <laughs> in there. Take that number, multiply that by 10,000, and the amount of extent of fraud is just enormous. Wow. Again, Hillsborough County has been the epicenter of that fraud in the state of Florida, and we have been number two in the country, only second to New York. And those wow, dollars. Number two in the country? Yes, sir. And um, what the, this That's would. not the kind of thing you want for Hillsborough County. No, and believe me, the money being generated is not staying necessarily in our community. <laughs> um, they're going to fund other organized criminal activities from prostitution to human trafficking to the drug trade. Um, it's a very extensive network that has been established right here in Hillsborough County. 
Um, so I worked uh, the last 15 months with the Sheriff's Office, the National Insurance Crime Bureau, the insurance industry, and other stakeholders in the community to figure out what can we do to target and put the clinics, targeting the clinics, and put them out of business. Um, the larger problem that we had faced was that uh, many of these clinics could become exempt from, um, from licensure requirements, typically uh, in state statute. And so what our ordinance did is it, is it closed the loopholes from the state statute. It requires that all um, clinics that um, receive PIP income over 90% or $200,000 in income per year to uh, register and to get a license here locally. Everybody goes through the background checks and um, you know again that spotlights them spotlights them and allows and it's been it's allowed the sheriff's office to uh, really hone in those illicit clinics while minimizing the impact to uh, um, to legitimate clinics and we got finally got that ordinance passed in September 2011 and since then the number of staged auto accidents that have occurred in Hillsborough County has decreased by 62 percent uh, 50 percent of the illicit clinics have closed and wow. um, the number of questionable claims filed to insurance companies have dropped from uh, approximately 40 per month to near zero. Um, so we have had a dramatic impact in the last few months just from this ordinance alone. Um, and then, of course, I've been working with the state legislature and the governor um, to get more extensive uh, PIP um, laws passed in the state of Florida. So it's, a, it's been a big problem here. One of the things that I've liked about our current county commission is you all seem to work together pretty well. I mean, there's only two Democrats and the remaining Republicans, but you all seem to get along pretty well. Is there a formula for that? You know what I think the formula to success, Bill, is that 95% of the things that we focus and we choose to focus on um, affect the whole community and not just a political party. And I think that's part of the problem that we have found um, in our uh, country and also our state is that things have become so politicized and people are more concerned oh, yes. about Repub Republicans versus Democrats versus looking at what are these problems, what are the solutions, and how can we come together to, uh, to work uh, to uh, find those solutions and to make progress for our community. And, and my personal philosophy is, you know, you need to put people before politics. You put ideas before ideology. I think Mark Sharp agrees with you on that, and I know he takes a lot of hits. Well, absolutely. And, and again, uh, when we look, and I think that's one of the greatest challenges that we face, is that uh, every time you hear in the news, uh, people especially involved with government, it's always about the Democrats versus the Republicans or the Republicans versus Democrats. And I've run across some people that won't even have a conversation with me simply because I happen to be a Democrat. And, <laughs> and so I've, I've, found, I've found other people that would embrace me because I am. And my philosophy is, you know, all the things that I've accomplished, even as part of the minority on um, the county commission, is because I put all that aside and I'm, and I'm focused very much on the problems and the solutions. So I work extensively across party lines to get things done for our community. Well, and I think that there are several good people on the commission who are Republicans who do the same thing. Well, absolutely. They're willing to put their flag out there and say, this, this is right. This is what we need to do. It may not be a dogma of the party, but it's right. Uh, transportation is one of those things. At, at, you're at spot on, Bill. And that's why, um, you know, you can say what you want, read what you want about the county commission as a whole, but um, we have a very, I feel we have a very collegiate and, and hardworking body. And again, 95% of the things we focus on have been nonpartisan. Uh, we've had great spirited debates. Um, we don't always agree with one another, but that's part of the process. Two people agree with them every time. There's no need for one of them. That's right. And so, um, you know, it's, we've had such a, it's been so, um, it's been good to work with such a collegiate body. And I wasn't sure that that was going to be the case when I came in there because of the past um, history that the commission has had. But um, every single one of those members have something uh, unique to contribute and have made a difference, I believe, in our community. Let's talk about the budget. Where do you see it going and who's going to get hurt? Well, you know, we thought we were down um, towards the bottom of the, uh, as far as um, the economy goes. And we believe that we are just about flat there now. We were expected we, to run in our second year of our biennial process. We thought we were going to be flat as far as any uh, increases or decreases 
in um, property tax revenue, or what they also call ad valorem revenue. Um, we got a surprise about a month ago, and actually are going to be short an additional 14 to 20 million dollars. Ouch! Now. Yes. And so um, <laughs> we're sharpening our pencils again. And one of the things that we, we are very confident is because the amount of reorganization that we have done, uh, we believe that there's going to be minimal impact to our employees um, in the organization. So we've done a lot of that reorganization already. Um, so we're looking at perhaps using some one-time money to try to fill in those gaps. And we're also so I heard some bonuses or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, Is 14 million shortfall kind of cut that out. Uh, well, we're going to see, we're still working with our employees. Our employees have been through an awful lot in the last few years. Um, they've gone uh, without raises for four plus years um, as far as just the simple cost of living raises. And um, doing more with less. And doing a lot more with less. And some of them taking on extra responsibilities, but uh, we have a lot of committed employees. So I'm very proud of our employees and, and the job that they've been able to get done for the resources that they have. So uh, we're looking to provide a little bit of relief for our employees. What do they do? They're not looking at pay raises right now, at least. Um, that is not built into the current budget. We're looking at different type of compensation reward programs that would be that would base that are incentive based. Um, but there's a lot of uh, still work that we're doing on the legislation that they passed in the uh, in the Florida legislature last year that prohibits a lot of a lot of the. Uh, um, Incentive, uh, for instance, we used to give incentives for uh, years of service, and so that we had to do away with. Um, so there's nothing built in the budget so far, but again, we're looking for different opportunities of how we can at least get the cost of living um, reinstituted back in there, but that certainly is not finalized yet. Well, it's very difficult. I mean, but we're in a time period when there's a lot of people out of work and a lot of people looking for jobs, and I don't a lot of these times when I see especially people hired at very high wages, I really don't understand it. They're, can they be the only one out there, especially in the supervision levels, that could do that job and they have to be paid that high money? Well, it's interesting that you mention that because, again, we've done a lot of restructuring over the last few years. And uh, there's been a lot of people that um, um, have their pay grades have been shifted around and um, they're taking on a lot more responsibilities for no um, or very minimal more, uh, amount of additional pay. And uh, so m almost every single one of our employees in our, in, within our organization are learning, and they have learned to do um, a lot more with less. And, and the people that still remain there, um, you know, they have a great attitude and, um, and, and they're really just committed to, uh, to our residents and to this county. Have we learned anything from the agreements that we signed in the past, like the one with our previous county manager that had these great parachutes on them? Will uh, we be doing that anymore in the future? Uh, I would think not. In fact, uh, when we signed the contract and arranged that with Mr. Merrill, we had extensive conversations. Um, and I continued to, uh, you know, in fact, it was a little bit of a battle to get the language that I thought that was appropriate inside the contract um, to make sure that we don't have a repeat of what uh, we had just gone through. Um, those types of payouts are absolutely um, unacceptable to me, and um, contracts going forward are going to be a lot more frugal and uh, we'll certainly not have those types of golden parachutes that were attached to previous contracts. I've never really understood it. I've been in small business all my life. I run a training company. We've done training all over. I audition for my next job every time I do one. I've done well because people have hired me back. But I don't have anything that says, if you don't want to hire me again next week, you're going to give me a huge check and send me down the road. I, I don't understand these kind of contracts. And I think an average people out in the street they don't understand this either, especially when they're making 30000 40. What is the average wage in this county, 40000 It's roughly, it's hitting the mid-40s, um, and we've actually, we've come up a little bit. We're approaching, I believe, close to 50, um, but uh, you're, you're absolutely right. And certainly small businesses um, have not been accompanied to that. Now, uh, some of the, the co larger corporations, uh, those types of contracts uh, have been negotiated with uh, with the CEOs and such, but certainly I don't think that they're appropriate for uh, for the government. No, I, I don't think so either. What are the last ideas you'd like to leave the people with? What are the things that maybe we haven't covered yet that you really like to go over? 
Well, I think what people really need to understand and realize is that uh, this community has been through a lot. Our country has been through a lot over the last few years. Um, we've been through a lot of challenging times, uh, both in economics um, as well as politically. And uh, what, I, what people just need to realize as, as we reflect back on these times, uh, how we were able to get through these times is by working together. And, uh, you know, people, as I mentioned before, you know, it's got to be, we have to lose a mentality that it's us against them, it's me against them. Um, it's not about me, it's about we. It's about the community as a whole. And as I mentioned, I think when they write the history books, uh, Bill, I really think that we'll reflect back and say, you know what? We have been through some challenging times, but um, by coming together and working together and thinking outside of the box and functioning as a community instead of individuals, uh, we got a lot accomplished and things look a lot differently. Uh, government's going to look different. Um, we're going to be more efficient. We're cutting a lot of the red tape. We're working with the city. Uh, I think you're going to see a lot more um, involvement as far as uh, additional things uh, uh, are getting done. Um, and, and like I said, it just people just need to realize that we have to uh, stick this out together. I, I kind of wonder what happened. We had the greatest generation. Now we've got I've got mine generation. And that's just a little scary to me. Well, definitely the generation gaps. It's interesting as part of the mentality because uh, um, with, the, uh, with the older generation, um, that had been part of the philosophy, especially ones that have lived through the, through the Depression and some, of the, uh, and some times that we haven't seen. Um, um, you know, that's how they got through it. And today, unfortunately, uh, uh, it's just gotten to the point where we have been, become so divided as a country and as a community. And you know, part of the reflections that I always have is, is right after 9/11, um, uh, as a horrific of an event that was that day, there was something that happened afterwards for a period of time that brought and unified this country. And yeah, it's sad we lost that. And we have. We did. We lost it. It, it was wonderful. It was miraculous. We worked together for a short period of time, but then all of a sudden, it was gone. Yeah, and so uh, that's the. Certainly that sentiment we need to get back to towards, um, again, looking out for one another and, and working more together as a community. And that's what I continue to promote as an elected representative. Well, I was really happy. I live out in Sun City Center, as you well know. And I was delighted when I saw both you and Mark Sharp standing there working on this project together for a group of people that needed help. And I think that our county commissioners do more of that, work together. There's going to be those that are complaining that you're working with a Democrat or you're working with a Republican. But it isn't all bad. There's a lot of good stuff there. And Kevin, I, I really appreciate you being on the show. Well, thank you. I really appreciate you having us here, Bill. And um, like I said, there's, there's a, we have a lot more work to do. And so that's why I'm signing up for another four years. And so uh, I really look forward to, uh, to working with the community, to working with you, and we're continuing to make progress. Well, hopefully we'll have you back then. <laughs> I'm Bill Hodges. This is Spotlight on Government. We've had Kevin Beckner, our county commissioner in state, or countywide, District 6, maybe statewide someday. You're unique, you're special, and you're great. Tell yourself so often because you are, you know. And we'll see you on the next Spotlight on Government. And Kevin, thanks again for being with me. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Bill. It's been a pleasure.